invite you to open your copy of uh, God's Word uh, to the book of Ephesians. Uh, uh, Surprise, surprise. And uh, we've still got a ways to go. Uh, But we're going to back up and look at the text that uh, we skipped over a couple of weeks ago. Once again, I want to thank Leland for stepping in last week. And uh, uh, what a powerful message uh, our brother brought in our Thank God for that. It blessed my, uh, blessed my heart, and uh, I know it blessed yours uh, as well. Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to begin uh, reading in verse 4, but remember what verse 3 says. It says we're to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This morning we want to preach on the subject, diversified unity. There is one body and one spirit. Just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, When He ascended on high, He led captive a host of captives, and He gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, He ascended, what does it mean except that He also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is Himself also, He who ascended far above all the heavens, so that He might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, and to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Henry Blackaby tells the story of two brothers who uh, attended the same church. They they were not getting along, though. They They had exchanged some unkind words to the point that a division had taken place in the family. I mean, it even got to the place that their individual families were not even speaking to each other. But they kept attending church. They were actually in the choir. Uh, They sat on opposite sides of the choir. They sat on opposite sides of the congregation. And uh, it was evident to all that things were just not right. The church was scheduled and they entered into a uh, scheduled revival meeting. And one night before one of the services, the pastor called each one of these men separately. And unbeknownst to the other, they were going to have a meeting. And they met in the basement of the church. And the preacher confronted them about their attitude. He got real specific. To the point that both men broke down. And they began to weep. They repented of their sin. But their weeping was so loud that it could be heard 
by those that were gathering in the worship center for the revival service. At the end of that service, both men came and they stood before the church. They confessed their sin publicly. They confessed their repentance publicly. And revival broke out in that church. As a matter of fact, uh, each night the crowd grew. The revival went on seven weeks. To the point that after the first week they had to find a larger facility to meet in. People from all over the district began to come to see what was going on. To the point that uh, people from other counties and, and other districts began to come. And this revival spread all over this particular country. And it spread to other countries. And it spread to other continents. And it became known as the Great Canadian Revival. God wants revival. God desires more than anything to send revival. But one of the things that revival is contingent on is unity. Unity. Think about that. Unity can create a atmosphere by which revival can breed. But disunity can prevent revival. That's why it's so important, Paul says in verse 3, be diligent, work at it hard, make it one of the things you do and you go overboard in to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Unity. Working together. Teamwork. Listen, unity is essential to the fellowship of a church. Unity is essential to the furtherance of the gospel. And, and then Paul introduces another word here. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's the word one or the word oneness. Uh, back in the 60s and, and 70s, there was a rock and roll band known as Three Dog Night. And they had a song that they made popular simply entitled one and and the lyrics of that song included the words one is the loneliest number that you'll ever do now that may be that may be okay for a rock and roll song but that's not the way God intends it for the church As a matter of fact one should be the number that we attain to that we may be one. Jesus prayed uh, in John 17. He looked to the Father and He says that they may be one even as you and I are one. And He said, I and the Father are one. Uh, unity. Now, now, now notice this. He doesn't tell us to create unity. He's already done that. He's already done that. We're to live in that unity that He is that He's uh, uh, created. We, we, we're, we're, it says in verse four, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. I mean, as far as God's concerned. God's got one. God understands oneness. God has given us oneness. We're to, we're to, we're to live within that, that oneness. And when we don't, we're found opposing God. When we don't act as one, we, we find ourselves in a way, whether we realize we're not fighting with God. That's never good. But then Paul takes a turn and, you know, he... he, he he says, yes, we're one, 
but we're not the same. See, oneness is not everybody be like Harris. You know, oneness is not everybody be like Janice. You know, one is not everybody be like Dan. You know, we're, we're one, but we're different. Well, don't you know it would be boring in church if, you know, if everybody was like me or everybody was like you? I really understand it being born if everybody was like you. I really can't understand it being born if everybody was like me, but that's, that's what God says. There, there's a diversity. We're to, we're to live as one, but we're to, we're to, we're to work in our diverse gifts, uh, uh, Paul is, is teaching us. He says in verse 7, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift individual gifting see Jesus is calling on uh, has a calling for each of us and and in that calling it, it's a calling for allowing uh, us to lay in his hands and give and surrender back to him the talents and the and the the, the abilities and you know the, the the gifts the the opportunities that he puts before us And it's all a part of His work of grace. Grace. You see, the grace of salvation unifies us. It, it, it levels, grace levels the playing field. You see, it, 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 it takes the same amount of grace to save the richest man in the community as it does to save the poorest man in the community it takes as much grace to save the one we might think to be the most important in the community as well as it does to save the person that we might not even know or haven't even given a thought about grace listen unity with diversity is a beautiful sight. And so, Paul talks about three things in this passage. He talks about grace, he talks about gifts, and he talks about growth. And let, let's look at those. First of all, Paul talks about grace. And uh, the word gr grace was a favorite word of Paul. He used it some 90 times in his uh, letters. So, so what is grace? Well, Grace is tenderness, grace is mercy, grace is pity, grace is gentleness, grace is love, grace is favor, grace is forgiveness. And we could go on and on. There's, there's so many words that we could use that, that would be a, a way or a part of describing grace. But maybe you've heard this acrostic of grace. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. It's God doing for you and doing for me what we could not do for ourselves. It, it, it is a gift that you and I do not deserve, but God extends anyway. Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Twas blind, but now I see. Grace. Greater than my sins. Marvelous, matchless, wonderful grace. So when the Apostle Paul thought of Jesus, he thought of grace. When he considered his unregeneracy, he thought of grace. When he looked at unregenerate man acting like unregenerate man acts, he thought of grace. And if Paul could have seen you, and Paul could have seen me, at that moment before we came to Christ, as, we, as he could have seen Christ extending grace, he would have thought of grace when he thought of you, and he thought of grace when he thought of me. See, grace is acceptable. You can receive grace. You know why you can receive it? Because it's been offered. 
you and I can receive grace because God offers grace. Uh, it's been offered to everyone who will receive it. Think about that. Nobody. Think of the most intolerable person you can think about. Now, I hope you had to think a while before you thought of that person, but, you know, maybe not. God offers grace to them. Think of the person that you might think is so wonderful and so great that they might not even need grace. Well, first of all, everybody needs grace. Grace has been offered to everyone. And, and you have received grace, or if not, you can receive grace, because grace is acceptable. Grace is also adequate. Adequate. It's benevolent. It's beneficial. See, it's benevolent because I don't deserve it. And it's beneficial because it meets my very greatest need. Grace. But secondly, he speaks of gifts. Look in verses 11 through 14. Paul, uh, Paul lists uh, a number of uh, gifts that, that uh, God has given to the church in, 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 in areas of leadership, apostles and uh, prophets and evangelists and uh, pastors and, and teachers. You know, we, uh, uh, we don't have prophets uh, in this day like we had prophets in the Old Testament, but still, prophets of the Old Testament would not be any different than if we had prophets today uh, in, in the sense that, that prophets, uh, their job was to foretell what God had already foretold. You know, prophets just didn't go around, you know, sharing their ideas. Prophets foretold what God had already revealed to them. Uh, and the same thing would be true today, is the fact that if we're going to be genuine, if we're going to be uh, uh, in line with God, we only talk about what He's already talked about. We only foretell what He's already foretold. He says there's, there's evangelist. You know, evangelists are a gift to the church. You know, evangelists have a special calling. Uh, uh, they, 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 they come into a church to, you know, not just preach a series of means, but God's given them a, a gift to know how to draw the net. To, 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 to call in, to, to, to draw... Uh, those that, that God has been working with and God's been convicting. A lot of times evangelists can point out, they have a, a, a spiritual sense, they can even point out the predators in the church. Then they're pastors. Pastors are called to shepherd. Pastors are called to protect. Uh, pastors are called to protect the flock and direct the flock. And they're teachers, those that rightly divide the word of truth. Now, to some degree, evangelists and pastors and teachers, uh, those terms can be, uh, or they can exercise interchangeable ministries. But each still has a distinctive talent for performing special task teachers that, the, the, the Greek word that's translated teacher there refers to one who is able to instruct uh, it's, it's, it's the picture of a dietitian that takes the, the raw materials the vegetables and the starches and the, the meats and they know exactly how to prepare each one of those and even how to present them on the plate to where it is delightful, to where it is palatable, to, to, to where it's something that you just want to, you know, as they used to say, belly up to the table and partake. You know? That's what a good teacher does. A teacher prepares and a teacher breaks down and dissects and uh, uh, the Word of God and uh, 
he, he, he or she is like one that, that leads along. Paul uh, talked in the book of Galatians about the uh, uh, pedagogos, which was one, uh, which was a teacher that would take a child from its earliest days and teach them and lead them to maturity. He said the law was like that. The law was necessary until grace entered the picture. So we have a teacher. But you know, we, we live in a day of uh, specialization. We probably all have a general physician, you know, family doctor, you know, the one that we go to for our checkup. But there are times when that family doctor, after doing an exam or physical, or we go to him with a problem, that, that doctor might say, uh, you know, uh, I want you to see a specialist. A specialist. And whatever that specialist might be, there's a reason we might be sent to a specialist. Sometimes God will bring into the church a specialist. For whatever reason that might be. So, there are... They're the, they're the gifts. Now, there are pastors who have prophets' spirits. There are evangelists who are, are uh, pastors. There are pastors that are good teachers, and there are pastors that have the gift of evangelism. It says that he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Why? Necessary. Necessary. Why? For the equipping of the saints, verse 12. For the work of service. The perfecting of the saints. The work of the ministry. The edifying of the body of Christ. To a mature man. You see, I'm afraid too many times we at church, we, we treat church like a spectator sport. You know, uh, I heard football described one time as uh, uh, 2,000 people in the stands desperately in need of exercise and 11 men on the field desperately in need of rest. Church can be that way sometimes. Ah, but, but let me tell you what the church is. <laughs> now, uh, foot. Football's messing with my illustration here because we have no huddle offenses now. But, but, but church is like the huddle, you know. As it, the church is like the huddle. That's where we get the play. That's where we get our assignments. And then we, it, at the end, we break the huddle, and we go out onto the field and in, into the world. We go out into the mission field to carry out our assignments. And every every person. Uh, uh, on the team has a specific assignment and if, if one person lets down on their assignment there's a chance it might not turn out too good for that play. We all have a place that we're to the building up of the body of Christ and, and look at this part until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to to the fullness of Christ until. Preacher, when are we going to get there? Well, when we get to glory. We're not there yet. We're not even close to being there yet. Until. We're to, we're to continue to function with grace. We're to continue to use our gifts until that day. The unity. of the faith there's that word again unity of the faith when diverse gifts work together humbly sacrificially surrendered to him serving together listen that's what Jesus died for that's maturity it's, it's growing up, which brings us to the final point. We've talked about grace. We've, we've talked about the gifts that, that God has given. And then there's the growth, verses 15 and 16. And Paul wants us to grow up. And he, and he says, be careful. Don't, don't, don't be like children that are t 
tossed here and there by every new thing that might blow through a particular church. You know, there, there are those that will say, you know, God wants you rich, and there must be something wrong with you if you ain't. Or God wants this for you, or God wants that for you. No, God wants you. And He wants us to grow in grace. He wants us to use our gifts. And so verse, verse 15 and 16 gives us a picture of maturity in Christ. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects unto Him who is the head, even Christ. What a picture. Unity. Serving each other. Doing our part. You know, some people are hands, some people are feet, some people are ears, eyes. Some people are, people are ligaments holding things uh, together. But it's each of our part to build each other up. You know, everybody likes an attaboy every now and then, you know. Everybody likes a pat on the back. Everybody likes to hear you doing a good job. Everybody likes to, you know, it's, it's good to hear, you know, Man, I'm glad you're here. I would have never thought of doing it that way. I could have never got that done. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we want to bring this in for a close. I love sports. I think that's obvious. I talk about it a lot. I used to could play sports. Now I'm limited to chasing a little white ball around a pasture. Or, uh, cornhole now one of these days I, I hope to learn the sport of curling that I don't know there's something about curling that fascinates me you know sleeping with that brooms and you know and all like that but years ago I was watching a uh, uh, a program on ESPN and they were they were following the Japanese Little League team that was preparing to come to America to participate in the Little League World Series. And in this documentary, they, uh, they showed a particular practice. You know, now, none of my Little League coaches ever did this to us. But in this practice, it showed each of the players tied together by a rope. Around their waist was a rope. I mean, the left fielder was tied to the center fielder, was tied to the right fielder, was tied to the first baseman, was tied to the second baseman. All of them were connected so that when one of them moved, all of them had to move. They had to work together. It created a mess. They'd fall down, trip all over one another. And it showed throughout that practice with little segments how they went from being very, very clumsy with each other to moving fluidly as one. As one. Grace. And not just grace. Diversified grace. Grace as it's manifested and worked out in each individual part causing the growth of the body. Now, it's important that I know my place in the body. It's important that you know your place in the body. And don't say you ain't got a place in the body. You've got a place in the body. God's, God's made a place for you in the body. When you got saved, you, you, you had a place in the body. And it's, it is up to us, surrendered and humble before Him, to allow Him to show us what that place is. And hey, listen, He may allow you some very uncomfortable moments while you try to find that place. He may allow you to try something and, and make it very obvious to you, it's not here. My brother-in-law joined the choir one day. I still don't know why. And, uh, but he had, God had done a work in his life and he just, you know, and he looked, I think I'm going to join the choir. I don't know who helped him figure out why that was not his place. I mean, if he'd asked me, I'd have told him. 
But he finally found out that wasn't his place, and so he tried something else. Listen, that boy tried here. I mean, he probably had a handle on half the ministries of that church. But let me tell you what he was doing. He understood God had a place for him. And he found that place. Security. And he was good at it. And he loved it. And security may not be your place. Teaching may be your place. Singing may be your place. Thank God God gave some people in the church voices. Now, God, you know, uh, He'll accept all of our singing because I believe in God's ears. It all sounds good when we praise Him from our heart. You know, he just gives some a good voice where we can enjoy it while we're here. Musical ability. Maybe you're... Uh, maybe your job is organization. I've got, a, I've got a, a daughter that can drive us totally crazy in her organization, but we all know where everything fits, where everything goes. You know your place in the body? Are you fulfilling your place in the body? What's God saying to you right now?